Look at this graph. Look at it. Do you feel the pain? This is the trend line price of a kit of memory. And this graph alone is the killer of our PC build lists. These build guides used to be a staple for the website and we'd occasionally bring them over to video format, but memory prices and GPU prices had months of simultaneous insane inflation, so to speak. They were ballooning like crazy from supply shortages on both sides. This made PC building difficult to afford. With GPU prices stabilizing and memory on <coughs> sale, still higher than what it used to be, but we thought we'd put together a high-end Threadripper system and see how it does. This is the first PC build we've published in months aside from the gift build we did for ZDG, the Patreon backer, but we're trying to publish a few during the holiday season. Links for everything will be in the description below as always. This coverage is brought to you by iFixit dot com and their ProTech Toolkit. iFixit is refreshing their ProTech Toolkit in time for the holidays. You can find a link in the description below to the ProTech Toolkit and other toolkits that iFixit sells. We find the ProTech and Essentials kits to be the most useful for DIY enthusiasts. So a couple things here. This is a PC build. PC builds are a minefield of everyone being smarter than you. That's just how it is. All the I've seen the comments. I've seen what you people say to Paul and Kyle and all of them. And it's not new to us either. We've been posting PC builds on the site for, I don't know, five years at this point. And the thing is, for this build, it's a couple items of note. One, we're only using parts we have. Two, it's a build that I'm going to use for some production rendering and that we can apply towards things like, for example, Blender rendering, animations, things like that. Video compression, H.264 compression of our video library that we store for B-roll. These are real use cases that we have, so I don't care what you would put in the system instead. That's not really the point. The point is, this is what we built, and I'm gonna show you how it performs, and uh, if you can do it better, great. Do it, I guess. So, yeah, uh, PC builds. This one is a system that we actually have used for. It's got a threader for 1950X. We're gonna go through all the parts and some benchmarks in a minute. And originally, I was going to include the 1920X, but the prices, right when we were looking at starting this build, the prices fell to where the 1950X more or less became 1920X in price. Dropped $200 to 800 bucks. And I, we, we own these parts already, but for purposes of creating a list within a certain budget, originally the goal was 1920X. We went with 1950 because it's $800 now. The motherboard is a Gigabyte X399 Designari board or designer, if you prefer the bastardized version. And it's got a kit of G-Skill 3200 megahertz memory at 32 gigabytes because you need the memory for this type of workload. Uh, we threw in the ASUS 10 ATI Strix. It did just win one of our awards in the GPU awards show we did for best overall cooler design on a 10 ATI. And uh, then there's plenty of options for other things as well. But this is what we went with. So to address a few obvious points straight away, Yes, you could do a cheaper power supply. We have a, a Seasonic Prime in here. I like the power supply and it's reliable. It's not going to have any problems. It has all kinds of protections in it, so we used it. It's, it's going to do production, so it needs to be reliable. Uh, but yeah, you, you could definitely cut costs in a few places. We're aware. But uh, let's go through the benchmarks and then, you know, if you want to shave off a couple hundred bucks by choosing cheaper parts, you could absolutely do that. And in the article that's linked in the description below, I will include suggested alternatives if you would prefer to use something cheaper than what we did, because there are cheaper options, uh, but we might not have had them here, or for my purposes, I didn't want to use them in a system that I was building for whatever different reason than you might be. So the first part is the 1950X. We originally were going to do this with the Threadripper 1920X as noted, but this was a good deal. So it didn't really increase our budget target, but it got us a better CPU for our intended render tasks. For Blender workloads on the CPU, all that really matters is threads. Frequency definitely helps, but high thread count is our first priority. The 1950X solves this. It's also power efficient, so that's a bonus, and it's pretty easy to cool in general. At $800, the 1950X is an especially good deal for a high-end production PC right now. This isn't something that's built for games, really. You'd be better off with Intel for that still, even the i9 platform if you're really serious about regular gaming at high frame rates, for example. But that's not why you buy a 32 thread processor. So to catch everyone up on Threadripper and its use cases with this amount of threads, one of the issues around launch with communication with AMD was we basically asked them, hey, we can CUDA accelerate all of this stuff and it's faster. So what's the use case here? 
Why should we care? And uh, they didn't really have an answer for us, but we found a couple on our own. And one of those is with rendering Blender files. Uh, there's another type of, of rendering that we started doing where if we design, for example, a high quality 3D model to eventually turn into an orthographic image to put on a shirt, like uh, that's convenient, like this one, exactly like this one. So we designed stuff like this in Blender and uh, then uh, it's 3D model, but you do an orthographic view and you basically get what appears to be a two dimensional image. So for something like that, we've found that the CPUs actually make a lot of sense in Blender. And that's because uh, the tiles render so quickly that you basically just want as many tiles in flight at once as possible. And so the uh, 32 thread CPU helps there. So that's a real use case where the CPU can start to edge out the CUDA accelerated stuff. Another use case is H.264. So we talked about this previously where our video compression script to shrink down all the B-roll and stuff like that is done with H.264 encoding. We use Handbrake, which is like a wrapper for FFmpeg. And you could do that with CUDA as well. But I mean, our script works great. It's fairly lossless as far as the human eye can tell. And it runs on the CPU. You could, could accelerate it again. But I mean, if it's reliable and it works and it's like a business critical operation, you really don't want to screw with it. So that's another good use case for Threadripper. Uh, those stated, in terms of benchmarks, we previously tested the 1950X in Blender and found the performance results that we can put on the screen now. These are not surprisingly just outside of the 7980XE performance range at $2,100. But the 1950X is among the chart-topping CPUs. It's fairly affordable and, well, comparatively to the other HEDT stuff anyway. And uh, it's doing well here. We're also using, in terms of video cards, the 1080 Ti Strix for this build specifically. But the plan is to put a couple more cards in here. And then you could use it as a render box uh, for GP rendering if you wanted to do that instead. This 1080 Ti Strix won our best overall award in the 1080 Ti category. To briefly recap, the Strix version of the 1080 Ti's has the best noise to thermal performance that we've found on an air-cooled card this year, and it manages to maintain proportionally low MOSFET, VRAM, and GPU temperatures. Even with a noise normalized output of 40 dBA, the Strix card was only ever beaten by liquid-cooled cards, and the Strix requires less overall real estate internally while still maintaining competitive temperatures. This means higher clocks. Pascal does drop clocks once you go above 60 C, and it also means that we can keep the operating noise levels a bit more reasonable on the build. We're using the Gigabyte X399 Designari board for this build. This is the first time we've used the Gigabyte board for Threadripper. Up until now, it's all been done on the $500 Asus Zenith Extreme. Gigabyte's board comes in $100 cheaper, but sticks with an eight phase VRM that uses 50 amp IR3556 power stages with a familiar IR35201 voltage controller. Gigabyte is using a 3 plus 2 phase memory VRM with 40 amp power stages for the DDR4 voltage, which is more than enough for what we're doing. The heatsink is somewhat thinned, so that's way better than most of the RT heatsinks that are out right now, sadly. So we can give some credit for that. It's not an ideal fin density, but it's better than a fat block of aluminum, so whatever. <laughs> give and take, I guess. The airflow afforded by the top mounted CLC amply cools the VRM anyway, and ignoring the more obvious VRM features, we also like the insane amount of fan headers that Gigabyte put on this board because we put them to use. There are seven total fan headers, all four pin PWM, and all seven are on the border of the motherboard, which makes them a bit easier to hide and route the cables behind things rather than over things. The other boards on the market, a lot of them do have headers crammed between EPS 12 volt headers or behind the video card, which is a pretty small and insignificant, but otherwise noteworthy feature where Gigabyte makes theirs more accessible. The Gigabyte BIOS needs a serious improvement though. It's mostly navigable, but we'd like to see Gigabyte add more options at a top level rather than bury everything in sub-levels, and we'd like to see them move away from the slide-in menus on the bottom and the sides, which really just get in the way more than anything. Memories next. This is a bit rough right now. We want to use quad channel for this machine, so we need at least four sticks, and we're going to be going with 32 gigabytes. Unfortunately, there's no good way to get around spending $400 or more on a 32 gigabyte kit of memory from a retailer. We're using stuff we already have, as noted, but for a new build, you're really getting kind of screwed on the memory. Rather than thinking of the $200 discount on the 1950X as savings, 
think of it more as your extra budget for memory. That'll help neutralize the feeling of being raked through the coals for overpriced DRAM. 3200 megahertz is enough for what we're doing, and going beyond that will largely net diminishing returns given the tremendous price increase. So here's the power supply. This is admittedly where we went a bit higher end than necessary on the system. We've recently started developing a serious appreciation for the high-end power supplies like the EVGA T2 that we've been using. And in our own production machines, high-end PSUs have for years now saved us from short circuits, overcurrent, power surges, long run times are afforded by the high-end PSUs even under abusive loads. So for anyone who needs reliability, it is actually worth the investment to go with something higher end. Sure, you can drop down and get a $80 to $100 power supply and be fine. Yes, we know. You're way better as a system builder and everyone applauds your comment. But this is what we wanted to use specifically for a high-end build production machine. Seasonic's Prime Series has good options between 80 plus gold and titanium, depending on how crazy overkill you want to go. And it's got options in the 850 to 1000 watt range. We'll be talking about power numbers in a second though. 850 watts would be enough for this particular build and would let you operate within on 115 volts from the wall. You'd be well within your 50 to 60% peak efficiency range if you wanted that. And if you're doing multi GPU for rendering configurations, you'd want a higher power supply wattage, obviously. We'll let you make that call though. This will particularly hinge on whether or not you're using the 1950X and 1080Ti's simultaneously to render or do whatever, or whether one is doing all of the work on its own. For power consumption and using the titanium class Seasonic unit, just because that's the one we have, it's going to be a bit more efficient, obviously, but perhaps needlessly so when compared to the acceptable efficiency of gold. We found these numbers for power on the screen, because they are titanium rated, they're pretty close to one to one draw in terms of efficiency. With this build in high performance mode and with stock clocks, we're drawing 115 watts idle. That's again, high performance mode, you can drop it down. 272 watts, multi-threaded Cinebench, 128 watts, single threaded, 274 watts with a single CPU instance of Blender and spinning off two Blender instances, one on the GPU and one on the CPU rendering from both ends of the animation. That gets us to 425 watts. So say you've got 300 frames, you render one to 150 and 151 to 300, and that's what we get there. We've done things like this in the past when we needed to get things rendered as quickly as possible but couldn't fit more cards in the system and we would set the CPU to render some of the frames and let the GPUs handle the rest. At 425 watts for peak load, we have more room to work with for the overclock. So later overclocking the CPU to four gigahertz all core at 1.35 volts and then the GPU to a plus 75 megahertz offset plus 500 megahertz core with power target max. We ended up at 580 watts for the dual CPU plus GPU render and that increased us by 40 watts for the gaming test with Total War Warhammer and increased us by 130 watts for Cinebench. Keep in mind that a 4 gigahertz overclock on the 1950X will sometimes deliver worse performance and that would be in cases like gaming because games can leverage XFR that goes beyond 4 gigahertz. So with 4 gigahertz all core, we'll actually have worse single and quad thread performance but better all thread performance. Just depends on what you're doing. We chose the Thermaltake View 71 for the enclosure. We've worked with a few full towers this year like the Be Quiet Dark Base Pro 900 White Edition but we liked the View 71 for this build. The case is surprisingly well ventilated thanks to the large gaps around all the panels and accommodates our Enermax Liquitec 360 millimeter radiator pretty well. You wouldn't think that it's good in terms of cooling but if you look closely, you can see that there's giant one inch gaps between every single panel, including the side panels. So that solves that problem. We also relocated some things in this case. So although it's mostly sufficient for airflow with the stock setup, we ended up moving the fan from the rear over to the front, relocating it so that we could have two 140 millimeter rain fans in the front. It would be a bit more symmetrical that way. And then we installed a blackout NZXT fan in the back. That cost you a couple bucks. This was for three primary reasons. One, it looks better, so that's easy. Two, we want it to feed more air straight into the GPUs, as if you're planning to add multiple cards for rendering, for example, to accomplish them more quickly, then the extra fans in the front will definitely help with that. Three, we've got three exhaust fans set up with the LickTech unit, so we needed to make sure that there was no suffocation in terms of the unit's ability to pull air in from the front, and also make sure it doesn't steal the air from the GPUs. So the case makes it a damn heavy build thanks to all the tempered glass, but this thing shouldn't really be moving once it's in place anyway. It's going to be doing work. For the cooler, we're using that 360 millimeter LickTech unit. We could have gone with the Noctua NHU14S, but we wanted two things. One, 
the ability to scale up the GPU configuration to fit as many cards as possible for rendering, which means needing slot clearance, and two, lower noise normalized performance. The Liquitech cooler is expensive though, so anyone who can get by on air or is going for a single card config would do pretty well, actually better off with the NHU-14S from Noctua. It's much cheaper, it performs not that much worse, and it's a perfectly good cooler. It's just a matter of does it work for your use case. As our thermal test results show, they're both good coolers. They can adequately cool the CPU even when overclocked. The Liquitech though is high quality. We took it apart and it's got a well-built block that's easily refilled, so we've liked it thus far. We've been pretty impressed with the Liquitech TR4's overall quality and honestly speaking frankly here, we really don't really attribute quality to Enermax units, but the TR4 ones are pretty good. They This is the best that they've done in a long time and they're outperforming their competition who went with smaller cold plates. Plus the cold plate actually has microfins all the way across. So Enermax, job well done on this one. Here's a thermal versus time chart for the Liquitech cooler under an intense load in this VU71 case. For this workload, we were torturing the system with a simultaneous Prime95 AVX load and a moderate GPU workload, meaning we're throwing off pretty close to the maximum heat potential in this case. Even still, we're at around 56.8 degrees Celsius for T-Dye, and the GPU, again, was running a workload as well. So it's not just the CPU here, and the CPU is perfectly fine in terms of thermals. It has no problems whatsoever. We're actually gonna be using network storage for this. So talking about storage, your options would probably be something like a RAID configuration. You might do something like a three-way WD RAID RAID setup for something smaller and cheaper. Data redundancy and speed requirements vary entirely based on the user. So that's up to you. But we've used WD Reds for RAID 5 in production systems in the past and are currently actually, and that works for limited drive bays or limited cost setups. RAID 10 might be good for a machine like this though. We're just gonna be running off of an SSD for the OS and then run a 10 gigabit cable to our local server. So that solves all of our storage concerns instantly. So that's the build, those are some of the benchmarks. We have a project of converting the office basically to a 10 gigabit setup. It might make a video on it. Uh, the plan there is going to include compressing a bunch of videos on the NAS remotely from another system. So something like this, it'll actually utilize the threads on this machine and then access the files over Ethernet, compress them, we delete the old ones, and it really improves our process. The machine will be torn down after it because I need all of these parts for actual benchmarking. That's the reason we keep them around. It's not to make a bunch of computers. It's so that we can benchmark them as things iterate and drivers come out and new tests emerge and things like that. So it will get torn down, but that's kind of the intended use case for this. Um, there are lots of things to improve if, if you really were going to go buy and build something yourself from scratch. I would, for example, the fan setup I like with the two intake and one exhaust, so you'd want to buy a fan for the exhaust. If you do the liquid cooler setup, then probably I just run it at a lower RPM. You could save money by going with a 240 millimeter if you want to keep the liquid cooling, but the 360 looks pretty good in this case. So, uh, and they're not that distant in price and it is technically better. If you want with air, you might run into issues with blocking off the top PCIe slot. Um, but if you're only doing a couple GPUs that can be lowered down, then that's not a big deal. One concern is with M.2 devices, if you're running multi-GPU here and they're under heavy load from Blender rendering on all of them, the problem is with M.2 devices, you're gonna have them buried under those cards so they will incinerate. And the flash doesn't care. The flash actually likes to run at a higher temperature when it's active. It should be stored at a cold temperature but run at a higher temperature. The controller cares. Controller might throttle you if it, if it really starts burning from the video cards. Uh, so that's a concern. That might be a legitimate reason to, I, I don't know, go with a U dot, to, well, I can't really do that. You just go with a different interface basically, or try and figure out how to get a fan on those. That uh, would be my concern. But yeah, power supply could be a bit cheaper. The, the motherboard's fine. He could do a little cheaper, but there's, I wouldn't want to. You're buying a thousand dollar CPU. What's another 400 on a board at this point? And um, yeah, I think that's most of it really. Just storage is up to you. So that's it for this one. If you want to see more, subscribe because we're gonna be doing a bit more work around holiday seasons when I try to do a bunch of 
logistics and office like upgrade or web server upgrade, things like that. Uh, as always, patreon.com slash gamers nexus helps out directly. Store.gamersnexus.net to pick up a shirt like this one now that you know how it was made in Blender. And I'll see you all next time.